Good morning, church. Good morning to those of you who are joining us online. Um, I began a series last week that I want to call Doorways to the Beautiful, talking about the spiritual gifts that are given to us as encompassed in the fruit of the Spirit found in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But I want to take a brief hiatus today and talk about something a little different and come back to that next Sunday. Um, you'll see in your, in your handout that I've entitled this Strong Families Build Strong Churches. I really think that family faces a crisis right now. Marriage faces a crisis right now. And I'm very thankful that the elders have uh, initiated this class for our young marrieds. And that's very important. I hope if you're young married that you participate in that class. But all of us really need to focus on and, and defend marriage as it's presented in Scripture. Because I believe we are at a crisis point in our culture in many ways. The fact of the matter is that this is no longer a Christian country. And I think we might as well face up to the fact that we live in a post-Christian America. I hate that, but it's just a fact. It's the way it is. We are now, as Christians, the counter culture. We're the ones speaking out against the prevalent culture that presently exists. I believe we're fulfilling the same kind of role that Jesus did. And I want to give you an example of that. It's found in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Notice Jesus, as he begins that sermon, will say, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt do this or thou shalt do that. And he will reiterate that several times. What's he doing? He's quoting the conventional wisdom of the time and he's saying, I disagree with that. That's not right. Here is how you need to understand this. This is what you need to believe. He is standing counter to the prevalent culture of the day. When Paul writes the book of Romans, Paul writes counter-culturally to what's going on. Man, read Romans chapter 1 and see if that's not the case. And it is incredibly important, if we're going to be salt and light in this world, that we stand counter to the prevalent culture that exists. Our culture has now redefined man and woman, it has redefined marriage. And I hate that we've lost that word war. But the fact of the matter is that we have. A professor at a medical school, and I mentioned this in an article in a bulletin recently, a professor at a medical school out in California was presenting a lecture to his students. And in that lecture, he made the statement uh, alluding to a woman being pregnant. In just a few minutes, and I've listened to it, he stops, corrects himself, says, I want to apologize. You all understand, I know that a man can become pregnant. Now, brothers and sisters, that's insane. And I would argue that our culture has lost its mind in many ways. Seriously. And more than ever, it needs to be spoken to and addressed. Because when it pervades even the practice of medicine, and reality is no longer the basis of the discussion, but fantasy becomes the basis of discussion. When we are no longer allowed to culturally correctly have a gender reveal party when a woman finds out that she's going to have a little girl, hey, I remember how excited everybody was when the Wicks finally got around to having a girl, don't you? I mean, wasn't that cool? And we had a gender reveal party. And wow, they're going to have a little girl. And everybody celebrated. No, not anymore. How dare you dictate to your child their gender? They can't help their sex, male or female, but they get to choose their gender. Since when? 
Since when? We have allowed this unbelieving pagan culture to define man and woman in a sense, in a nonsensical way, that just now creates this incredible cloud of confusion. The same thing holds true um, when we talk about marriage. For 5,000 years, folks, back to basically the beginning of recorded history, marriage has been what? It is a social compact between a man and a woman. Its given purpose is procreative. Above all, it is designed to provide an, a, a, a careful, planned place in which children can be born and nurtured and protected and raised. And all of a sudden, uh -uh. that's not the case anymore. Marriage has now been redefined. And so I'm listening to a fellow the other day, for instance, listening to a podcast. And this man is talking about his marriage. And he's talking about how he's looking forward to having children with his husband. And I would, did I just hear him right? Yeah, he and his husband are looking forward to having children. And in a similar situation, I was listening to a woman who was speaking. And she was alluding to uh, raising children, and she and her wife were raising their kids. And the fact of the matter is that anymore, no longer when you hear that somebody is married, can you assume what that marriage looks like? Now you have to ask, don't you? Or wait to find out, well, exactly, or is, is this man married to a woman? Is he married to a man? Is this woman married to a man or is she married to a woman? Because marriage has been redefined and it's done nothing but really confuse. We are called to stand counter to that culture. We've got to. If the church is going to remain healthy, my, honestly, my prayer, my desire, if, 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 if the, the earth's still here 100 years from now, I pray to God the Fort Gibson Church of Christ is still here. Over 200 years old. It's over 100 years old, it's still here, it's healthy, and the reason is because we've had strong families in the past. And these strong families have helped to produce and continue a strong church. And that's not accidental. We are the beneficiaries of people who stood strong for God, who stood strong in their faith, who raised their children in the Lord. And that's one reason why we have what we do today. And we can't drop the ball. We have got to continue that tradition. We've got to continue and defend our families and, and marriage and, 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 and training up our children in the way they should go. I believe it's more critical than ever because now we have no social support whatsoever for traditional marriage or family. We don't. If you turn on the television or you watch a movie, who's the biggest idiot in the family? Invariably, dad. Dad's a moron, always. And everybody's just having to clean up after dad. Now contrast that to 50 or 60 years ago when I remember father knows best. And they meant it. And that was written into the script and that was the way it was. And that was upheld and that was honored. And we have flipped that 180 degrees now, haven't we? If our children are going to grow up with a healthy understanding of marriage, of what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a mother, what it means to be a father, that is going to be not just taught to them, but caught by them. That's incredibly important. Men, you need to gird up and buck up and stand up and be men, godly men, godly fathers, godly husbands, men who take seriously the responsibility that you've been given 
The world wants to blow that off. The world wants to denigrate that. The world despises that. The world wants to get rid of family, period. But guys, Scripture clearly lays at your feet. Bring up your children in the way they should go, right? Don't provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Paul will tell us in Ephesians chapter 6, over and over again, it's going to be stressed that it is the man who is to be the spiritual head of the family. It is the man who is to be the spiritual leader. One of the reasons that our country is in the heartbreaking mess it's in today is because we've got a bunch of Peter Pans running around who refuse to assume responsibility for their maleness. They're fathering children, but they won't be a father to their children. They're ducking responsibility that is God given to them. And the result is that we have this mess. I read the other day and this I, I blew my mind. Do you realize there are five times as many gang members in Chicago as there are policemen? You begin to understand why there's the unbelievable violence going on in Chicago that there is. And you know what? It's not because they don't have enough cops on the street. It's because they don't have men who will be fathers to their sons. That's the problem. We've allowed marriage to disintegrate. And we've allowed men to walk away from their God-given responsibility to train up their children the way they should go, to be an example for their kids. And we are paying a price. Not just socially, but economically and spiritually and in every other way. We are borderline on the edge of disaster and chaos right now. And it's because we won't address the problem. Oh, we got to defund the police. We got to fund the police. We got to do this. We, no, we've got to fix our families. And Congress doesn't want to deal with that. Government doesn't want to deal with that. But I liken it to this. If I, <coughs> if I have stomach cancer and I go to the doctor and the doctor looks at me and he says, you know, yeah, you're, you're very ill. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to prescribe a high calorie liquid for you to drink because you're not eating enough and that's why you're losing strength. And here's a pain reliever to take care of the discomfort that you're feeling. What's he doing? He's treating the symptoms. What do I need? Man, I need surgery to cut the cancer out of my stomach. Brethren, all our culture is doing today is treating symptoms. It refuses to recognize the disease. The problem is our families are falling apart. That's the problem. But oh, no, we can't talk about that. In the church, we've got to talk about that. In the church, we've got to stand up for the man. If we don't, who will? And we've got to show the world there is a better way. All you hear today is marriage being redefined and or denigrated. Do you realize we have 17 million couples living today without benefit of marriage? 17 million couples cohabiting. Why? Well, because marriage has been spit on and denigrated and made fun of to the point that people really don't pay much attention to it anymore. It's just a piece of paper. No, it's not. It's a sacred compact. And it's designed to provide stability to the country and stability to the church. And without that, we're in trouble, and we are. Ladies, don't let the culture lie to you. Success in life does not lie and how much money you make and how much power you accrue to yourself. That is not what makes for success, ultimately. There's nothing you can do any more important than raising your babies and training your children and loving them and guiding them and directing them. Nothing is any more important than that. And I'm not denigrating or taking away from pursuing a career. I'm saying we need to get our priorities straight. And right now, too many men and too many women don't have their priorities straight. They don't have their focus where it needs to be. And we're paying a horrific price in our culture because of that. And it's going to be in the church. It's going to be people who honor God, who honor His plan 
who honor his design, who practice it, that are going to show the world something better, something different. You know, it's not accidental. I want, if you've been married more than 50 years, would you please stand? Been married more than 50 years. Okay, looky here. Thank you. You can be seated. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. Well, it's been a while back now. And he was talking about a conversation that he had on a train with an individual. And they were talking, and he was talking about how he was, he was celebrating his 25th wedding anniversary. And this guy said, 25 years? Really? You've been married 25? I don't know anybody that's been married 25 years. Now, in a group this size, look how many have been married 50 or more. And we got some others closing in on 50. That's not accidental. That didn't just kind of sort of happen. There's a reason behind that. Okay? And it brings an incredible stability that this country and the church desperately needs. As we talk about being a family, as we talk about strong families, it is so important as moms and dads and grandparents that we assume responsibility for training up our children in the way they should go. Again, I honestly believe that kids are going to be far more influenced by what they catch than by what they're taught. They're going to watch you and they're going to see your example and that's what they're going to mirror and that's what they're going to follow. It's so important. I want to get back to some fundamentals just for, just for a minute. And I've talked about these before, but man, we can't get away from them because we have and we're paying a price. We've got to teach our children respect. We've got to. It's not, it's not a nicety. It's not a negotiable. It's not. We hear all this criticism today, you know, of hierarchies. Hierarchies are horrible things. You know, you, you got all these hierarchies in society and all these power grabs and all this kind of stuff. Listen, if you'll think about it for a second, you can't function without functional hierarchies. Where would the military be without hierarchies? Where would they be if any private could tell any colonel, no, nah, I don't want to do that? Wouldn't work, would it? There has to be a chain of command. There has to be a hierarchy. There has to be an understanding. And that must be respected and obeyed. It's the only way it can function. Otherwise, it will not work. You look at any successful corporation, I guarantee you, it is a collection of hierarchies. And those hierarchies must function in a healthy way for that corporation to function and be healthy. God designed the family to be a hierarchy. Christ is at the head. The husband is at the head of the, the, husband's at the, head of the family. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul makes that as clear as anybody could ever make it. The husband is to be the head of the family of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Couldn't be any clearer, could he? Why? Because somebody has to be the decision maker. Because somebody has to have the final say. Somebody has to be held responsible. And guys, that's squarely on your shoulders. But that must be respected. And the problem we have today is, I want to ask you, who's respected today? Seriously, who's respected today? And what's the result? The result is an absolute cultural chaos. Leviticus 19, verse 3. Each of you must respect his mother and father. I am the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 5, 16. Honor your father and mother as the Lord your God has commanded. Leviticus 19.32, rise in the presence of the age, show respect for the elderly and revere your God. I am the Lord. Romans 13 verse 7, give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. We have got to model and teach respect. And yes, dad, you have the right to demand that your children respect you. 
Mom, you have the right to demand that your children respect you. That's not coercive. That's not punitive. That's just right. Because if they don't respect you, who are they going to respect? And if they don't respect their teachers, if they don't respect the police, if they don't respect those who are in positions of authority, what kind of mess are we going to have? Let me take you to any big city today and I'll show you. That's what we've got. We have sown to the wind and we're reaping the whirlwind. Because you cannot function without healthy respect. It's not wrong. To teach your children to say yes ma'am and no ma'am and yes sir and no sir. I know that's becoming increasing a foreign language. It's not a bad thing. For them to learn what it means to respect the elderly. And to show respect for their parents and to show respect for their teachers. Again, that, if you'll think of, that's one of the glues that holds society together. It is. And it's critical. We need to teach our children and let them learn from consequences, from good choices and poor choices. That's one of God's favorite teaching methods, brethren, it's consequences. Adam and Eve faced consequences in the garden, didn't they? The children of Israel over and over again faced consequences. You want to read God teaching consequences? Read Deuteronomy 28 through 32. That's a covenant of blessing and cursing. And that's what God is doing there. He's saying, listen, if you follow me and you stay faithful to me, I'm going to bless you and here are the blessings. And if you don't, I'm going to curse you and here's what you're going to face. And he meant it. He meant it. There are consequences to your choices. We don't do our children any favor if we allow them to duck consequences. If they mess up and we try to cover for them and we, and we try to let them get away with stuff they shouldn't get away with. That's not what we're called to do. That's not training them up in the way they should go. They need to learn. You make good choices, good things happen. You make bad choices, bad things happen. Man, that's life. And if they don't learn it when they're children, they're going to get slapped in the face when they become adults, aren't they? We need to establish boundaries in our own lives and in the lives of our children. A few months ago, I just, I can't tell you how frustrated and angry and upset I was when I heard about this 12-year-old child who was shot by a policeman in an alley in Chicago at 2 o'clock in the morning. And I wasn't upset with a child. I wasn't upset with a cop. I was upset with the parents. Before God, what business does a 12-year-old have in a street alley in Chicago at 2 o'clock in the morning with a gun. Explain that to me. That's not juvenile delinquency, that's parental delinquency. And there's way too much of that going on. Way too much of that going on. That policeman was a victim and that child was a victim. A victim of broken families and misunderstood responsibilities and abdicated responsibilities. And it's not going to get any better until we begin to assume responsibility. We have DAs all over the country now letting criminals out. Because they consider these criminals who have shoplifted or, or stole a purse or that kind of thing to be victims. Okay, you can argue all you want about that. The fact of the matter is they are victimizers because there are people that they stole from people they robbed who are victims. And so are you going to free the victimizers by calling them victims and then make more people victims because of that? When are people going to be called to answer for what they do and made to face consequences for what they do because that's what's going to cause you to stop doing stuff you don't need to do? Man, if I can shoplift and walk out of the store and I get slapped on the wrist and immediately I'm back out on the street, what am I going to do? I'm going to go shoplift again and then I'll go shoplift again. And who's the victim? The victim's a poor store owner who's trying to make a living and getting robbed blind. That's the victim. 
We have got to teach our children boundaries, and we have got to, we've got to have boundaries in our own lives. Ephesians 5, verses 3 and 4. Listen to Paul. But among you, he's talking about Christians, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Now what's he saying? He's saying as Christians, when we get together in our lives, come on folks, you got some boundaries. You're not telling dirty jokes. You're not cussing. You're not getting into stuff that the world gets into. You're not descending to that level. You draw a boundary. You don't go there. That's not who you are. I'm telling you, on Facebook, that's not who you're to be. That's not who we're to be. We don't share nasty stuff on Facebook. We don't use foul language on Facebook. We don't use it, period. We draw boundaries. If we don't, who will? Finally, we've got to teach faith and values. Show by our lives that faith. Show by our lives those values. And then teach that faith and those values to our children. When Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, he will talk about Lois and Eunice. And he'll say, these two godly women, grandmother and mother, their faith is the reason for a Timothy. And that's right. Timothy's no accident. Timothy didn't just happen. Timothy came about because two godly women were determined to raise a godly child. And they did. And Paul acknowledges that. In our teaching our children faith and values, we are growing godly, Christian, responsible citizens. They're going to make this country a better place, make this church stronger, make a positive difference in people's lives. We are leaving a legacy that we desperately need to be to be leaving, okay? And who else is going to do it? I've made the point before, but it deserves to be made again. Steve was raised by a godly mom and dad. I was raised by a godly mom and dad. Barrett was raised by a godly mom and dad. All five of our serving elders were raised by godly parents. That ain't no accident. That ain't coincidence, and excuse the ain'ts, but I want to emphasize. There's a reason for that. And that legacy is invaluable. This church is indebted to godly men and women who went before, who trained up their children in the way they should go, who stayed married to each other throughout their lives, who remained faithful to each other and faithful to the Lord, who trained up their children in the way they should go. And that's one of the reasons why we're able to be what we are today. And if we want that legacy to continue, it won't be accidentally continued. It'll be continued because we grab hold and we do what God wants us to do. Strong families build strong churches. Let's vow vow before God that we are going to be the people of God. We're going to show the world something different. We are going to be light and we're going to be salt. And we are, as the days go by, more and more going to show this world in all its sickness and insanity. You know what? There's a sane, viable alternative an alternative that works. An alternative that produces love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and godliness and faithfulness and goodness and self-control. Yeah. It can be. It's not accidental. But it can be. As God's people, let's be those people. We can help you in your walk with the Lord in any way. Whether it's to begin that walk as you're baptized into Christ 
or to encourage you to continue that walk, won't you come? While we stand and while we sing.